Hey, D, how is your sea of white daffodils coming along? Slow but steady, the first little bulbs flowered on Saturday. I hope that in future years, there are more and more. Here's the funny part. When I was planting them, yes. it seemed like there were a billion of them, and it took forever. And now there doesn't seem nearly as many coming through, so I have to laugh. Yeah, that is that is kind of the way it works. I I actually picked some daffodils on Saturday, I think. So we we should shout out our two pieces of advice if you're going to pick daffodils. Go for it. Pick them in the bud because they will open up within 24 hours and they'll last longer. And then they don't play nice with other flowers because of that sticky stuff, Mm -hmm. which probably clogs up the other flowers' pores. So put them in a vase by themselves. That's it. Well, it's all in the company you keep, isn't it? It is in the company you keep. And with that, <laughs> with we're going to get started. Welcome to the Garden Angelus, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Carol Michael from Indianapolis, Indiana, where I have a suburban garden measured in square feet. It's about a third of an acre. And I'm Dean Ash from Guthrie, Oklahoma, where I garden on seven and a half acres out in the country. I garden an acre and a half. We call ourselves Garden Angelists because we are evangelists for gardening. We love gardening and we want others to love it too. Yes, we do. And we aren't afraid to spill the beans and tell all of our gardening secrets, the good, the bad, and even the ugly. But that's enough of who, what, when, where. Let's move on to this week's episode, which I'm very excited about. I am very excited about it as well. So can I do my garden update? It's very exciting. Yeah, spring is springing. Go for it. Spring is springing. And on Thursday... March the 2nd, I think it was the 2nd, I got the text from the greenhouse owner and she said that pansies and violas were ready. They're actually opening for the season today, which is Monday, March the 6th. And of course, I don't wait for opening day. So uh, I was actually heading out to lunch with some friends and I thought, oh, can I cancel to go get my pansies? And I thought, no, settle down. I went and got them in the afternoon. Um, And I got them all planted up in the pots and some in the ground. And so I was very excited. And that that is the sum total of my update. Um, That's a pretty exciting update, especially for you. I've been sending you you pansy seed pictures for next year so that you can start some too. (laughs) I have several pictures on Instagram as well. I can can imagine that. You want to hear what happened in my garden? I do. I am like a long-tailed cat in a room full of rockers right now. There is just not enough of me to go around. I ordered Emerald Towers Everleaf Basil Seeds because I forgot to order them in all those deals. And I got those potato pots I talked about last week on the deal. And then while I was getting Emerald Towers, I ordered three um, one-pound packages of seed potatoes that I'm going to do in the three pots. We'll see how those go. And then... Um, oh, and the three potatoes, just so in people, if people want to know, are caribou, Desiree, and Sangra. Um, a Rebecca, though, <laughs> decided to jump into my cart. They do that. They do. I've had several plants try to jump in there. This one's called Sahara, and I have the seeds. I just saw them. They're right here. In fact, I laid them out. Well, I don't know where they are. Um, I laid them out because I've got to start them today, but I'm taking the pansy pots that I've finished with some of the pansies, and then I'm taking those and some other pots and I'm going to disinfect them and then start the Sahara in those. I also worked in the garden last Monday and Friday and got a little bit of help. And then I worked the bees on Sunday and I moved pots around the greenhouse and the house. So I got rid of my amaryllis and yes, people, I threw them away this time. I over summered some of them last year. I did not feel like doing it this year. They're ugly all summer long. Ugly. And I have to water them. I don't want to water them. So next year, I'm not going to get but three. I've decided three. I'm just buying three amaryllis. I know that seems crazy, right? You know, you say that and I'll make a little note and then we'll get to next Christmas and you'll, you're, never mind. Three will be what your first order will be. So I got rid of the amaryllis. I put the pelargoniums. They're actually sitting on the floor in front of the front door, but they're getting ready to go up on the sewing machine so they can get some light. I need more room because I started everything from seed this year. Yes. Yes. It takes space. I also, I, yeah, it is a big space and there's a lot of it. I want a lot of annuals. And so I've just had a blast. I'm getting ready to do a post on zinnias and link to Eden Brothers. Yes. They have so many varieties. Oh my gosh. Yes. 
And we have an affiliate link with Eden Brothers, which is nice. And then also I'm going to do, um, I just lost my train of thought because I thought of zinnias and you know how you are about pansies. The end. <laughs> what? What? Because I had a thought. Oh, I know. I'm looking at my seed list and I'm thinking Emerald Towers, Everleaf Basil. I know that I do not have seeds for that. It really made me mad. Here. Why don't I just share some of my seeds with you? I'll just mail them today. Well, Hold that thought because I probably have seeds left over from last year and they are probably still good. So I got to look. I still have to go through those old seeds. I sowed all my tomatoes, all my peppers on Sunday. I'm not growing eggplant from seed this year. I decided I just don't want to. Um, I got too many other things I'm started. Anyway, I'll probably do a video this afternoon talking about on just on my story about what all's in the greenhouse and what all I've planted. I did try the little um, Jiffy pellets. I've never used those before. The yeah. little composty, they're peat, they're peat moss pellets. You know what they look like? So you have to pour yeah. water in the little tray yeah. to get them to puff up. They look like sea monkeys. I remember on the back of the comic books and kid magazines, you could always <laughs> order sea monkeys. And we we never were allowed to order sea monkeys. We were not either, but they reminded me of sea monkeys because they just puff up and then you have this little, yeah, you know, it's a plug. That's what it is. It's a little plug, but they were handy and I needed to start my um, tomatoes and stuff really fast. So we got it done. Shall we move on to our first quote? We we shall, but while you breathe, because you, you're very excited. I will tell people in Indiana, a lot of people are starting tomatoes and peppers. I could almost see peppers now, Too early. but really don't rush it. You'll, you'll end up with a bunch of leggy plants. She's in Oklahoma people. I'm in Indiana. I will start them around April right. 1st, I think. Yeah. I mean, I start my mid-March, so I'm two weeks ahead. And even then I have people who, have, who are ahead of me, but I know our weather and I don't want to drag those plants in and out of stuff. No, you do not. For, you know, weeks. So it's such a drag. Now I will do the quote. March is a tomboy with tousled hair, a mischievous smile, smut, mud on her shoes, and a laugh in her voice. Hal Borland. I love that quote so much. I would almost frame it. Maybe I'll cross stitch it. Oh, it'd be so cute to cross stitch. And it'd be so much fun to stick that pillow or cross stitch thing in your... Because, you know, March, I think March is a lot nicer month than February. Well, duh. Although I'll tell you, uh, Friday, which was the third, we it literally rained all day long, all day long. It was a nasty day, but we had two glorious days over the weekend. But let's move on to the flower topic. Yeah, and it's going to get cold here again. I'm just saying. All right, flowers. here too. Our flower topic this week is annual flowers from seed that, that butterflies are attracted to, or in other words, that butterflies like, and. One of these that you put on here is definitely a larval host, and but most of these are nectar sources. That is true. So you want to share about how we might end up ordering more seeds. <laughs> well, I just made a note that said, at the risk of ending up ordering more seeds, we'll go down through this list. <laughs> and there are some that I, I do not have on my list. Mm -hmm. And so... I am reminding myself to be good. So zinnias, of course, is at the top of the list. Have we, have we talked about zinnias enough? I think we've done many shows on zinnias because you know what? When, when you have trouble growing dahlias, zinnias look just as good. <laughs> uh, don't let the dahlia people hear you say that, D. You're going to get us in big old trouble. <laughs> Move on. Move, Move on. on before we get in big old trouble. So let's talk about marigolds. I haven't started my marigolds yet, and I do have some seeds. I have an orange one that's really big and fluffy. That is a, a South. It, it, I have noticed that South African marigolds have gotten really popular since the success of Phyllis. Remember Phyllis from Botanical Interests? Yes. Yes. I saved a boatload of seeds from Phyllis. I've given them to people. I think I sent you some. I'm I do have some from you. Beautiful Phyllis. Again, I love the scent of the foliage. I like to plant marigolds with my tomatoes, even though it's not, it's been proven that it's not that effective to repel things, but it looks good. The smelly ones repel better than some other things. Um, 
I just like the new marigolds that have come out. They're just really special. Yeah. And I ordered a blend called, where is that on my list? Signet Jam, which is an old, old variety. I will direct sow my marigolds in the ground outside. I'm not going to start them from seed. Okay. I might do that too, because I'm, I mean, I'm starting them from seed, but I'm sowing them direct in the garden. I'm not going to sow them inside ahead of time. That other South African marigold I have is called Keys Orange. It is a big old fluffy orange flower. And I think I got my seeds. You know what? I don't know. I I think I actually got them from Baker Creek, but Select Seeds has it. And I'm going to send, I'm going to put the link in our notes just so you can look at it later. Okay. There, I really like them. I think the big ones are nice. And I like those small ones, like what you're talking about too. I think they're both great. They're more fun than the ones that just look static. Right. I know what you're talking about. Okay. So I added a few flowers that do well here. Um, and Lantana technically, I don't think it's an annual. I think it's actually a tropical because it becomes a big old shrub later, but here we grow it as an annual. So it counts. There's no butterfly plant. Okay. So you grow it too. Yes. All right. It could, you know, if you have a hard place with full sun, like around my fountain in the center of my potage, or that I only get water on it when it gets splashed, Lantana is a great plant for that. Just a great plant. And now they come in all kinds of colors. Back And some and some people here get them to overwinter in Oklahoma City, which is right. south of me. I can't, I can't overwinter them here. It's too chilly in the winter. But um, New Gold was one that turns into a big giant shrub in Oklahoma City. But there's lots of new ones. I like the pink and yellow ones. And I also really like Dallas Red. Dallas Red is one of the prettiest lantanas. And I think you can start it from seed. But I'm just doing that off the top of my head. Uh, okay. I, I would buy Lantana in the, in the green, at the greenhouse. I would too, because you know what? It's already started for you and it'll take off and grow as soon as it's hot. Do not plant this one early. This is one that you wait until it's starting to get hot outside and your nights are above 50. So plant it at the same time you would tomatoes and peppers. Right. Next one, pintas, which I got you to try, didn't I last year? I did. I did try them last year and I love them. And you put a note that says you can start them from seed, but they're slow. They're slow. They're slow. And so when you go to the greenhouse to buy them, they probably won't be in flower and you'll think, oh, that's just a boring green plant. Do buy them. They are carefree, Mm -hmm. lovely, and they just grow and grow and grow. Bees like them. Butterflies like them. I think hummingbirds like them. Carol likes them. D likes them. I mean, and there's all colors. There's white. There's kind of a bluish purple one. Um, there are some that Steve Owens carries that are from another another country, not Mexico. And I can't think of it right now. Maybe Guatemala or somewhere. Totally different type. Um, I personally like the ones that are purple, pink, red, and white. The plain ones from Mexico. I like those. There's also one called Stars and Stripes that has variegated foliage. Oh, now I want that. Stop it. And I'm not, no, move on, move on. (laughs) Okay. Our next flower is Mexican sunflower, Tithonia. And there's a dwarf variety of Tithonia that came out. Don't ask me the name of it. And then there's Torch, which is the one I grow. Um, Sometimes it recedes. Sometimes I have to start it. This year I'm starting it. I have never grown it. Um, I might look at it in the greenhouse. I know that she'll sell some as, but. uh, Put it in front of your sunflowers. It'll make you happy, happy, happy. And you'll have lots of butterflies. Uh, On that advice, I will. It's a big, bright orange flower. Not as big as a sunflower, about, I don't know, two inches on top of a stem. And then you just keep deadheading, deadheading, deadheading. And it just keeps producing flowers until until frost. And it's just an easy flower to grow. Again, another one like Pintas, like Lantana, don't put it out until it's warm. It won't. Duly just, noted. It will sulk. Your turn next. And I'm supposed to put the Tithonia in front of my sunflowers, which is the next flower that we have on here. Um, we could do two or three episodes on sunflowers. There are so many of them. I'm just basically growing the big, tall one. Yeah, like Maximilian or Russian Giant. There's a whole bunch of them up there. Um, I love sunflowers. I grow all different types. Tall. The reason I said about the Mexican sunflower in front is it grows five feet, four to five feet. And so it would be perfect in front of your 
big giant sunflower. Yes. And the variety of sunflower that I'm growing is tall uh, from botanical interest. I think they threw a, fr- a free seed packet in with my last nice. order. Nice. nice. I'm growing some that are um, in the burgundy ones. And in fact, I, after watching my rabbit hole, I ordered another packet of sunflowers and I have too many now. What? I don't know what I'm going to do with them all, but I'll find a place. The next one is Cosmos. Do you grow Cosmos? I have grown it in the distant, distant past. And I grew the one called, I think it's called seashell pink, which has sort of a curved petal. It does. But um, this year I'm, I'm actually growing one. I'm growing uh, apricotta, which I think came from botanical interest was a freebie that they sent to garden writers, mm-hmm. sort of an apricot color, which will be nice. So I'm going to sow those. They say you can just sow them direct outside. So that is what I will do. You can do both. You can start them inside or sow them outside. And I used to sow them outside, but the birds get to them too fast. So I'm starting them inside this year and I'm growing Rubenza and also an apricot one. I don't know that it, I think it mine is apricot dream, but I suspect they're all part of the same. So what I might do like with Cosmos and Xenias and Marigolds, instead of direct sowing them, I could at the beginning of May, just put them in a flat of dirt and keep it outside under, you know, under the eaves or whatever mm-hmm. and get them to germinate and then transplant them out. As yeah, long as I remember to water them, I think they'd be fine. They would be fine. The big issue here is always remembering to water them. And sometimes ah. I'm so busy that I forget to water things. So my plan, if I do something like that, is that I put them next to some place where I have to water something every day. Like there next you to some pots that I don't have on drip. Like they're not good enough to be remembered to water every day, Dee? I just don't have time. I can't. <laughs> this is a big place. Okay. I'm so the next one, next one is salvia. And the salvia genus, I think, is one of the largest ones in the world. And so there are so many different kinds of salvia. And you can grow some of them from seed. And some of them you grow as plants. And some you grow from cuttings. And I have probably one, two, three, four, five. I have five types of salvia in my greenhouse right now. Some are cuttings. Yes. And some are, I'm growing us, I'm growing fairy queen and serious blue, which is serious, like in Harry Potter. I'm growing both of those from seed. We'll see how they go. So far they're up. So we'll see how things are. Well, I have perennial salvia, but I, I'm going to grow the salvia that is for sale down at the greenhouse. She'll have them and she'll have all the all the proven winners ones and, you know, I'll pick out the different colors. And so it'll be all good, but I won't start those from seed. Victoria blue is one that's always at the greenhouse here. And then there's almost always new dimension. There's a few others and you can just find them at different places. So the next one you grow far more often than I do, although I did grow it last year. So that is sweet alyssum. And the thing is you can grow this from seed Uh, Tiny, 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 tiny seeds. And uh, I do not. I buy them from the greenhouse. Now, when I was there on Thursday, uh, she had some more cleanup to do on them because she had, I'll call it spotty, spottiness in the flats where some of the the starts or whatever the the little starts that they get didn't really take. So I told her I'd come back for those when she had a chance to kind of clean those up a little bit. But in my garden, now in your garden, as soon as it gets hot, they're going to peter out and be like, I'm done. Yeah. Um, I actually put them in the front flower bed last year and it gets a little shade once it starts to get hot. And they did pretty well for a long time. But we also had a very long, slow spring. I will say they smelled established and they smelled delightful and I really enjoyed them. I will probably not do them this year because I've got pansies there, blue pansies. Cause remember all my pansies are blue this year. How lovely. All different shades. Because remember I started five or six kinds of seed. That's amazing. So that will be my cold weather. Um, assuming we get some cold weather, which we're supposed to. So I don't know. Um, I like Adgeratum. I will say proven winners has one that is a little better with the heat than just the standard one. But again, if you let them dry out at all, they're gone. That's the end of them. Yes. Goodbye. So they have to be on drip here. I am uh, biased against Adgeratum because it was that blue flower. My dad always bought some. 
And then it seemed like that one just fizzled out so fast. And you're right. It doesn't like to be dried out at all. So no, you but if you from alyssum to adjuratum, but I'm ready. Yeah. Okay. I, well, you start talking about adjuratum. Was I talking about adjuratum? I meant to say alyssum, but you know, we have adjuratum and alyssum next to each other. So anyway, back to adjuratum. I have a native one that just does its own thing and grows and I have to pull it out by hunks. So I do not grow the annual adjuratum that is a night, you know, that, dies really quickly. Moving yeah. on. I would like to try the perennial adjuratum just to see if it would take here. So I don't I know. I can it. send you some cuttings. They're so <laughs> it has a square stem. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Let's wrap this up with dill, which I put on the list because I do see some butterflies around the flowers occasionally, but you're right. This is a host plant for their for larva. Tails. Mm-hmm. Yes. But it'll just come up like magic in my garden anywhere it wants. Great plant. I am moving my dill plant, dill seed. I'm going to just direct sow it and I'm going to put it over in the cutting garden uh, in front, you know, in an area in front, because I have a really, pro- the red wasps get in my boxwood right next to the potage because yeah. they figured out that I grow dill there and there are big fat caterpillars there every day for them. So I'm going to move, I'm going to move my dill just to confuse them for a while. That's my plan. That's that. I'm just going to let the dill just continue to grow wherever it grows. There you go. All right, let's Ready? move on. That's, are we done with that? I yes. said, let's move on. Like I'm yeah. the boss. I'm ready. In March, winter is holding back and spring is pulling forward. Something holds and something pulls inside of us too. Jean Hersey. That's a great one. That's true. It is. It is because you don't know whether you should be holding back or rushing forward. And, you know, you see stuff on social media, like do not rush to cut down all those perennials that you left standing for the insects until it's a little bit warmer because, you know, all your good work to provide them with places to overwinter might be for naught. Stuff like that. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I've cut mine down because you remember last, I think it was last time we talked about when you start to see insects flying, you can cut them down. So I cut them down where everything's cut down except for a few things in the front flower bed. And this week they're going to, so let's talk about vegetables. Okay. So we're going to talk about early spring sowing vegetables. And so I did some research on this because thank you. Uh, It could be boring, but we're going to make it all exciting and geeky because we're going to tell everybody early sowing, the thing you have to be concerned about is what is the soil temperature? Right. Because if it's too cold, things rot. Things rot. And so (laughs) I found this great chart at the Oregon State University on optimal, optimum soil temperatures for sowing seeds in the spring. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of interesting because So peas, you can sow from 40 degrees Fahrenheit to 75 degrees Fahrenheit, and they say their optimum is 75, which is soil temperature, not air temperature, because when it gets too warm, then the peas are all sulky, 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 mad. I can't can't speak this morning. Yeah, but I get what you're saying. They don't don't do anything. They won't put on peas, and in our case, they get mildewy and gross. Okay, so we have to sow them. Like now here. And now. I will I will start sowing mine around St. Patrick's Day. That's my traditional day. The soil's always warm enough. My traditional day is at the end of February because the soil's always warm enough, but I haven't had time. And so I may not have peas this year. And then lettuce, you found out was 40 to 80, optimum 75. If I wait until the soil temperature, it maintains a steady 75 degrees in this garden. It'll be all over. So I plant them now. Yes. Well, we'll talk about that because um, as the, as you get deeper into the soil, it gets cooler, obviously. Right. And so you're really talking about that top layer where the seed is going to be sitting. That's, that's where you're like that top inch. Especially with lettuce, because it's a tiny seed. And I think right here, we should repeat yet again, that you plant seeds usually at twice the depth of the size of the seed, whatever the size is. That's an easy way to remember for people, which for lettuce and spinach and kale and Swiss chard and radishes, which are all on this list, that's not very deep. So yeah, it probably does warm up early. And do I have a soil thermometer? No, I don't. But Carol does. 
Oh, of course I do. And so I've left a link on, uh, put the link on the show notes to one that's like what I have. Okay. Um, because I do go out there and I take the soil temperature just to verify it's above 40 degrees. But the other thing that people want to know is, well, how can I get my soil to warm up faster in the spring? Yeah. Um, so Not if here, you have a cold but... frame, mm-hmm. you a cold frame would naturally warm up faster. But mm-hmm. the thing the thing I found at Penn State, because I did some more homework, was, of course, well-drained soil will warm faster than waterlogged soil. We must pause. Dee is looking at something. There is a bluebird outside. It just flew by, and they're the most brilliant blue ever. And I'm sorry, I just had a moment. That's okay. I, I saw one the other day in the backyard, and it was sitting on my little rabbit statue. And I was trying to figure out how to not make noise from inside and take a picture through the blinds. I never did get it done. But well, this time of year where everything is kind of gray at Oh, they level. stand out like you know, amazing like right now. I mean, they're this most beautiful color ever. So everybody should try to get bluebird houses. But okay, sorry. We talked about birds last week. Come back. I'm talking about the fascinating <laughs> subject of how to get your soil to warm up faster, D. Raised beds, cold frames. Raised beds, cold frames, well-drained. Containers. And then if you, containers will warm up faster. And then if you really have problems... Rake back any mulch because the mulch will keep it cool. So rake that back. Okay. And then remember dark soils heat up faster than light soils. And if you really want to get things going, put a plastic sheet or paint a glass over it and it'll, it'll get really nice and toasty. So I have a question for you. Yes. Do you put that red plastic down before you plant your tomatoes? You know, that's so that's online. Years and years and years ago. They, that was supposedly a big deal, and I did, and I don't think I noticed much different. That's I didn't ever either. And you know what? Just wait a couple of weeks to plant your tomatoes and peppers. Yes. I know we're not really talking about those, but any anything that is not, just don't get in too big a hurry. But with cold crops in Oklahoma, get in a big. You're running out of time. Yeah. You need to be in a big hurry. We're now. not in a big. You didn't have to be. We're in not hurry. in a big hurry. And I did. I did find a quote from our friend Farmer Lee Jones. Our friend, like he knows who we are. Um, Gosh, I wish he did. Chef's garden. We sure love him. He said, "The health of the soil is the most important thing when growing anything." Amen. Amen. And so, before you run out there and start sowing, you should, of course, remove all the weeds because. You don't want your crops to compete. And then I will say a soil test is not a bad idea. If you aren't sure about your soil or maybe you had just iffy results last year, it just didn't turn out very well. Mm -hmm. And then if you live in an urban area, like in here, it would be inside the 465 high uh, interstate that goes around the city. They say inside that, especially you should have your soil tested for heavy metals. Mm Mm-hmm. Because it might uh, might not be good. We have we have areas like that here too, and if things aren't growing well in your garden in general, because I had a client recently. She's also a listener. I'm not going to say her name because I don't want to, you know. Um, she's having problems with her soil. I think I went over there and she had a lot of things that had died that shouldn't have died, and she waters, and her soil was moist enough. I, and I was like, hmm, I think I get this soil tested. There's something wrong. So, you know, if you're having trouble with something, um, there's something wrong. If you're, if you're sowing things outside and it looks like it's not like it germinated and then the next day you go out, all your little seedlings are gone. You probably have crows. That's what I have. (laughs) Yeah. That could be a problem. (laughs) Crow. I have a whole family of crows and while I love them, they can be a real pain this time of year because they take out all my labels and they eat my seedlings. It's just what they do. That's part of the reason I'm doing the zinnias inside too. That's a good reason. If I get them big enough, the crows aren't interested. They just want those very early seedlings. As you know, they want microgreens. Anyway, moving right along. (laughs) Your local cooperative extension, if you look, look them up and they could tell you where in your area is the best way place to go send samples. And then usually those sites will tell you how to take samples that will be worthwhile to test. And they have lots and lots of information on um, not just soil temperature, but on when to plant crops. I know that Oklahoma State University definitely does. I've, I've used them myself in the past. I just now have it all in my head. I know exactly when I've I have it all stuff. in my head, too. So and but I am. You know what? Not everybody does. No. 
I'm going to leave two links to a basic a basic soil thermometer. And then there was a fancier one that supposedly measures temperature, soil pH, the moisture, and sunlight. I'm like, wow, that's that's a lot. And that's quite fancy. Yeah, I'm not getting that. But you do the next quote. Daffodils that come before the swallow dares and take the winds of March with beauty. William Shakespeare in The Winter's Tale. I love that. And, um, you know, in England, daffodils are a big deal. They are a big deal. They're a big deal around here. Yeah. There's a place west, south and west of the city where this woman named Helen Link used to breed daffodils and grow a hillside of them. And they still, she's long gone, but they still open it up occasionally and garden clubs and stuff will go see all of Helen's daffodils. And I know about it because uh, one of the members of garden writers, garden communicators that I met lives next door to it. I haven't gone over there. I should go see her. And then the Helen Link that did all that daffodil breeding was once a member of my garden club. Isn't la, that la, crazy? La. That is crazy. That's so cool. Okay, so we're on the bookshelf and you got the, it's not technically a book, but it's a cool little thing. It is a cool little thing. And I'm going to, I'll hold up the box for you, Dee, so you can see there's this box. The box the is little, darling. The box is that darling. That company does darling things. I mean, if you're wanting to buy gift items, that's the company. So the, the, pro, the, it's not really a book. The cards are Home Harvest, Your Pocket Card Guide to Kitchen Gardening by Britty Cotter and Tom Gaunt. And we'll include an Amazon link. So like we said, it's not a book, but it's a pack of cards and they got information on all the different vegetables and uh, a few flowers and a few herbs. And even though they live in Australia, and so they have like plant spacing in centimeters and in inches, mm-hmm. if you live in a temperate climate, these these are very worthwhile cards. And so the way I would use these, if I were a new gardener, you could take these cards and read through them and then say, I'm growing that, I'm not growing that, make piles of the cards, right? share them with your partner or somebody that you're going to grow vegetables with. They have some cards that have some basic information. They've got a few herbs and it's kind of interesting because, you know, they, they're in Australia. They have um, cabbage butterfly problems too. Yeah. Cabbage butterflies are a drag. They're so pretty, but they're such a drag. Um, My question is. And then you, you said the art, look at the back of the cards. Isn't that pretty? The art is beautiful. I would, I'm all about that art. So the art is done by an artist named Edith Rewa, R-E-W-A, who did a great job. I looked her up on Amazon. She has botanical wrapping paper sheets that you might like. And I might. a botanical coloring book. And I, I couldn't see inside the coloring book. But I would gift these cards. If somebody was new to vegetable gardening, this would be a great gift to give them with some seeds and you know, a couple of little tools or something. Or if you're an old gardener like me, it's just fun to look at those and think, ah, you know what? Here's a card on mustard greens. Why do I not grow mustard greens? Because you don't like to eat them. I know. And then look what else they've got. That's a card on microgreens. Microgreens. Yeah. Of course they have it. Microgreens are hot. I guess. You can buy microgreens now. I mean, it's It's crazy how how hot they are. Yes. Um, I have a question. Since it's, since these people live in Australia and have a farm called Kinsfolk Farm. Okay. I found that on Facebook. Is, is everything backwards because their spring is our fall and our fall is their spring? No, it's not backwards because they, they, you know, early spring for them is when we have fall. So they just right. say early spring to midsummer, for gotcha. example, on kale or, that would or work. trans. Yeah. So they, they just do it by seasons. So no, yeah. it works just fine. There's, I wouldn't hesitate just because they're in Australia and we're in the United That's States. That's what my question was. Thank you for answering it. And they put the, like they said, the plant spacing is um, in centimeters and inches, which was it's kind of a nice lesson because if I keep mm-hmm. looking at these cards, I'll soon figure out how many, you know, I'll, I'll be able to think about centimeters more. So 
But anyway, that is that is what is on the bookshelf. And I really like it. And I'm kind of torn because I really like it. But I, I know some people that are just getting into vegetable gardening. So I don't know. You should share them or buy more. I should share them and get some more. But anyway, they are lovely. And that is Home Harvest, Home Harvest, Your Pocket Card Guide to Kitchen Gardening by Britty Cotter and Tom Gott. Artwork by Edith Riwa. And you could take them outside as long as you were careful to get dirt all over them. You know what? These these cards are, they're pretty sturdy um, and kind of not laminated, but slick paper. Very nice. Yeah. So you wouldn't have to take a whole book out there. No. And it's easier to share back and forth if you're talking with somebody instead of like, look at this page, look at that page, which there's nothing wrong with that. We promote a lot of books, but this is, look at this card and you can just pass cards around mm-hmm. and and then I would end up with, I'm growing these, I'm not growing these. Yeah, I like it. I like it a lot. Shall I do the next quote? Please. March is the month of expectation. Emily Dickinson, who we love. Yes, we do love that. <clears throat> okay, so our dirt. Um, our dirt was something I found, and I can't remember how I found it because I don't read Garden Rant every day. Garden Rant, for those who don't know, is a really famous um, gardening blog, and it's written by four or five people. And it used to be the same four people, but it's changed over the years. And they have guest posters. And I was a guest poster on there once. Were you? I do not believe so. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, it's usually if you want to rant about something. So her, Marianne Wilburn, who we really enjoy, she's such an excellent gardener, a great colleague. She's in Garden Calm with us. She wrote a defense of hellebores. And when I saw it, I may have seen it on Facebook because I follow Marianne on Facebook. And I'm, I think when I saw it, I thought, what? What? I mean, we have to defend hellebores? That seems wrong. It right? does seem wrong. But apparently, you know, if you read the we post, do. <laughs> people get all kinds of crazy ideas. Like these are poisonous. You shouldn't grow them. Oh my gosh. If you well, eliminated all the poisonous plants, <laughs> you'd have none. You would have no, you would have no plants. And so um, I went and looked at it and it made me go out and look and it was a great post and we're going to link to it because it was so great. And um, it made me go out and look at my hellebores because I was thinking about why does anyone have to defend something that is so beautiful, easy to grow and blooms with the hardly ever anything else is. Exactly. I mean, my, <laughs> that seems like my, my- Christmas roses, the the hellebores that try to bloom all winter, they are just outstanding right now. And mm-hmm. then the Lenten hellebores, they are coming on strong. They'll be so beautiful by Easter. That, and they last for such a long time. They last for months. The hellebores niger, which is our Christmas rose, it starts for me in about November, December. Yep. And it's still blooming now in front. And then the Lenten roses, which are pretty much Helleborus hybridus because they're hybrids of all these different things. Um, they have done some really good work with those. And I've invested, I, I this is how I feel about Hellebores. They are an investment. They are not cheap because if you want re- certain strains that do better in the South or in the North or wherever you live, you have to kind of order those. You can sometimes find them locally. And actually my other thing, I actually bought two Hellebores yesterday. But most of mine I've ordered over the years, or I've bought them from Steve at Bustani. So um, they're not cheap, but you know what? They're perennial. They handle dry heat in the summer. They look good in the summer. They bloom for a really long time in the winter after you trim back their ugly old dead leaves. What else can we? They're um, promiscuous. Yes. And then they recede. So I always have baby hellebores and sometimes I scratch those out and sometimes I don't. And I'm thinking I'm I'm going to take, I don't have any hellebores in front. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to scratch out some of the bigger seedlings and those babies are going to go out to the front. So I will have more hellebores to cut back in the spring next year. Hopefully they take a while to get going. Yeah. And you have to, we cut, we cut, I mean, I cut mine back in January is when I did all the ones that were the Lenten roses, because they really start at the end of February, starting to take off. And then, you know, anyway, they're really beautiful right now. I went out and I laid down on the grass and looked at them. And yes, some of them turn their little heads down. The newer cultivars tend to have heads that face up, but um, I just, I was like, 
Thank you, Marianne. Yes, thank you, Marianne. Here's the next quote. To welcome her, the spring breathes forth Elysian sweets. March strews the earth with violets and pansies, which you put on there because it has the word violets in it. Edmund Waller. There you go. I like it. It's kind of hard to say, though. Yeah. Rabbit holes. Do you want me to do my rabbit hole first? Yes, please. Okay, so Gardner's World throughout the winter has done these little series of specials where they kind of go back and recap some of the stuff they've already done. I don't get to watch Gardner's World every week. So some of them I've seen the little pieces and some I haven't. And then they always add in a little piece that they didn't add during the summer. Does that make sense? It does. And I need to get caught up apparently after reading your rabbit hole. So this one, which was number three, was great. And it had a whole section on perennial vegetables um, and and an allotment. This lady, she only grows perennial vegetables. And it was fabulous. And I made a bunch of notes. So we are going to talk about some of those perennial vegetables and whether they would translate to our particular climates. I thought, you know, we're going to do one a week, I think. And that'll give us more information about vegetables, which is really cool. The other piece of my um, rabbit hole is that they are starting their new episode this Friday. New season. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And I'm kind of excited. I was going to say, we both have BritBox subscriptions via Amazon. So we can see these via BritBox. Mm -hmm. They will show up on YouTube, but, you know, get them on BritBox. They show up and you don't, well, you aren't paying. I mean, you aren't, you know, you're, those are stolen. And back when we couldn't get those at all, we watched them on YouTube because that was the only way you could watch them, but they're weird. And they're just filmed on somebody's TV. I would lots rather watch them in high definition and see Monty plant like this week, even though it was a winter compilation, it was new information at, at Monty's house. And so he brought out all of his pots with his little bulbs. They're beautiful. Okay, now your turn. So I did finish cataloging all my books yesterday. And so they're all in this software. And (laughs) so I found a few more Lost Ladies of Garden Writing. And one of them that just sort of like, what? Was Grace Wilson. And I cataloged a book called Ferns and How to Grow Them by G.A. Wilson. And I assumed it was a man. But this software, if Mm -hmm. somebody else has cataloged it, you can like find their entry and then add it to your own database. And they had her out there as Grace. And I'm like, oh, she's hiding as G.A. Wilson. So I went immediately and looked her up. And somebody put a nice obituary in 1911 for her. So I knew all I needed to know about her. Wrote a blog post. But I I did a little more searching. And she had an older sister who died in 1871. So that's kind of sad. She only had the one older sister. Mm -hmm. And then I ran across some weird Mm -hmm. old journal that was written in 1882 by somebody. Had a ghost named Grace Wilson, which I think was no relation. (laughs) And then the newspaper clipping, which you can relate to, where Grace was bitten by an assassin bug, which she sent off to university to have identified. It hurt like the Dickens. It did hurt like the Dickens. Mine was a wheel bug. Hers was a kissing bug. They're all part of the assassin bug group. And they all have those sucking mouth parts, which really hurt. I That thing swelled up. And remember, I had to fly to England like the next I do day. remember. My I hand do. was so swollen that the stewardesses were asking me about it. Oh, my gosh. I just said stewardesses instead of flight attendants. You know, I can't help it. I grew up in the 70s. <laughs> So they they didn't have male flight attendants then. Anyway, I am fine with it. So I put a quote out on the internet because I couldn't find any quotes by Grace, you know. So I thought, well, I'm going to make up a quote and maybe the internet will, you know, somebody will find it and quote it. Thus did nature artistically adjust my failure, which also would make a nice cross stitch, wouldn't it? It would because it's the truth. Or a little sign out in the garden and you would stick that out there and then people would say, what? I'm like, nature did that. Yeah, because when it looks really good, nature does it. (laughs) Seriously. So do you have anything else to say about Grace? She was pretty cool. That is Grace, Grace Wilson and her ferns. I think it's interesting because, you know, women back then had to often post under their initials. I mean, post. They wrote books, wrote books under their initials because, well. Well, and there was a whole 
article about her finding some rare fern in Vermont where she lived. And they just kept saying Mr. Wilson and he, and I think, did they not even ask that whether no, she was a man or they just woman? assumed it was a man. So anyway, that's what, you know, anyway, I don't even want to talk about that. Let's go to garden commissions. All right. You're up. Oh, me first. I can oh, go first. Okay. I'm happy to go first. Well, you're going to talk about pansies and violas, and so am I. Well, I'm going to buy some more pansies and violas, and I think I'm also going to buy snapdragons and alyssum, and people will be all like, oh, it's going to get cold, Carol. Aren't you worried? It's like, no, this stuff will survive that cold. Move on. Mm -hmm. I also need to figure out my seed situation for real. And then I might do some light pruning because it's (laughs) trees are still bare, so I can prune some stuff. What? You, you, You haven't figured out your seeds yet? Well, I bought all these seeds and I have a database of all the seeds I bought, but a few more have entered into my life and I need to record those. And then I still need to okay. see, like, I think I have Emerald Towers basil. That's what mm-hmm. I need to do. But anyway, as I was saying, I might also do some pruning outside because it's things haven't leaked out. Although the crab apple and Japanese lilac are starting to get like, I'm like, pull back on the leaves, people pull back on the leaves. A lot of frost between now and May. So anyway, that's me. I might buy more pansies Hema, and violas. Did I mention that? Yeah. Hemimalis is blooming here now. Arnold's Promos is blooming. It's blooming here as well. Has been for a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Smells really good. Um, I have a question. So the Snapdragons you started from seed, didn't you win or sow those? No. Remember? Oh, you sewed them inside? I sewed the snapdragons inside. They've all germinated, and I have these little itty-bitty seedlings. Me too. Same thing. They're like the size of a pinhead. What are we going to do? Just start. I'm going to let them grow on, and then when they start to feel like they're crowding, then I'm going to tease them apart and pot them up into little things. They're not going to be my early spring snapdragons, obviously, but I'm going to put them. And I'll end up putting them probably in a container. I should have started those in December. That's all I'm going to say. About I, that. I think you're I probably right. Early I think you're probably but right. But you know what? Lately, the snapdragons have been lasting all the way through summer, as long as it isn't too, too hot. And I put them on the east side of the house, right next to the drip irrigation. So that's where I'm going to put these if they ever get big enough to plant outside. All right. I'm going to plant out the rest of my pansies and violas. And it's funny. I got a little bit of help from a friend in the garden. And uh, she said, D you aren't going to have a very long season for those pansies. I said, I know, I know, but you know what? Maybe you won't have a hot spring and they'll last a while, but I'll at least get to see them come to fruition. Then I'm going to plant the two hellebores that jumped in my cart at Lowe's yesterday. Also, by the way, Lowe's has those bulb gardens that are those pot refills where you can right. just put them in a pot. Yep. I put, I bought one that has hyacinths and little tiny, I'm not going to be tete-a-tete daffodils in it. Cute, cute, yellow with purple in the middle. Going to be beautiful. I put it in, I just took it out of its little thing and stuck it down into a terracotta pot. And it's actually sitting in here somewhere in the kitchen. Cool. Um, I'm going to have those inside. The hellebores I bought are Frost Kiss Anna's Red. And they are beautiful. The flowers face out and they're quite large, but I'm sure they're heavily fertilized in the pot. Yes. You know how they have grown in a greenhouse. So they won't be as big next year, which is fine, but I got to plant them out. The cool thing was on their leaves, they had pink veining. Did you send me a picture? No, you must have seen it somewhere else. It's it's a brand new fancy. In fact, it may be a Marianne's um, piece on garden rant because she did several pictures and I think she mentioned a frost frost kiss is a, is a group. It's a trademark group. I don't know. Anyway, they're really pretty and I'm excited about them and I need to get them put Hmm. in in the ground. So think about that. Why do I need to go to Lowe's? I need to go to Lowe's for, I don't know, maybe we'll get some light bulbs, just kind of breeze through the garden center. See if those jumping hellebores end up in my cart. They're really pretty. I was impressed by the leaves too, which you see the leaves a lot. So that's a good thing. All right. All right. Um, Anything else? I think we have done an outstanding job today, Dee. So I'm going to wrap us up. We want to thank you for listening to The Garden Angelus. I hope you've hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode. We publish every week on Wednesdays at 12 a.m. Eastern time. 
If you listen to Apple Podcasts, we'd love a five-star review. And thank you to everyone. I went back and checked our reviews recently. And thank you to all the sweet reviews that we got in December, January, and February. Thank you so much. Those help us get noticed by others and move us up in the algorithm. Could you also share our podcast with your friends? Word of mouth is still the best way to get the word out there. And be sure and check out our show notes for links for more information about today's topics, plus links to our own websites. And if you're smart, you will subscribe to our Substack newsletter, The Garden Angelus at Substack.com, which is also linked to in our show notes. And if you want to help support us, use those affiliate links, or you can make a monthly subscription through Buzzsprout or a one-time donation through PayPal. If you buy something after clicking through those affiliate links, we're in a small commission and it costs you nothing. Thank you to everyone who has made a small donation to our podcast. Thank you to Solvent. It was lovely to chat with all of you over the garden gate. Bye until next week. Bye, everybody.